It is a pleasure to introduce my colleague, Dr. Aran Lehrman. Aran is a lecturer in two departments here at Shalem College, the Department of Middle Eastern and Islamic Studies, and our new Strategy, Diplomacy, and Security Department. She has played a key role in. He is also the Vice President of the Jerusalem Institute for Strategy and Security, and since 2021, the Editor-in-Chief of the Jerusalem Strategic Tribune. He was Deputy Director for Foreign Policy and International Affairs at the National Security Council in the Israeli Prime Minister's Office. He has held senior posts in the IDF military intelligence for over 20 years. He served as, for eight years as director of the Israel and Middle East Office of the American Jewish Committee, a third generation Sabra, which he's very proud of, and he should be. He holds a PhD that from the- not withstanding. He holds a PhD from the London School of Economics. Which explains it. And his topic for today is the game of camps, a strategic overview of the Middle East. Please welcome Aron Lehrman. <laughs> President Robert, thank you. Um, to understand the war we are in now, about which we will have a conversation this evening, um, you really need to place it, to place Hamas, Palestinian Islamic Jihad, the Houthis in Yemen, the militias in Iraq that are trying to get involved, the elements in Syria that are part of the battle, Hezbollah in Lebanon, with which we are at, a, say, a mid-intensity warfare right now, you have to put them all in a setting that, and in order to understand that setting, you probably have to roll back almost to the day and a few uh, days off, 13 years ago, to the beginning of 2011, and what has been at the time so hopefully called the Arab Spring. Not a term that I would use nowadays. Too many people have died, not only here. Half a million, half a million in Syria by some estimates. Tens of thousands in Libya, in Yemen, and elsewhere. Moreover, if I have to borrow an image from nature, I would not talk about a spring, nothing to do with the birds, the bees, and the seasons. I would talk about, well, a uh, delicate subject now. There's been one in Japan tonight, um, an earthquake, an earth-shattering transformation. And to give you a sense of what happened and how it is related to uh, our question, of the question of where we are today. Um, let me tell you this in personal terms. I was, as uh, Ras mentioned, um, the, vice, the, the Deputy National Security Advisor for Foreign Policy and International Affairs, which is a fairly long title for a short guy. Uh, but, um, uh, and, and uh, I get a phone call on Shabbat morning seven o'clock in the morning, I get a phone call from the Situation Room. Ben Ali, president of Tunisia, has fled his country, packed up his wife, her 10 voracious brothers who have been eating up the country with large spoons, and uh, flew off to Saudi Arabia where he has been since, in exile. And I say, what? Say so yes, Ben Ali. We have firm evidence. Is is off. Um, when did that happen? They say around midnight. Say, Why didn't you wake me up? And they say, Iran. You, you, what happened? I mean, this is in Tunisia. None of practically tried to say it's not really any of our business. I said off off the top of my head that the uh, Shabbat that Shabbat morning. I said, no, no, you don't get it. It's the first time ever that an Arab, how I was taught by my great uh, late supervisor at L LSE in London, uh, Professor Eli Kaduri, to say, the first time an Arab potentate, ruler, dictator, actually fled his country, not because a group of 
uh, irate officers came into his uh, uh, palace and informed him uh, in so many words that uh, his term of office has been terminated with extreme uh, prejudice. No, he fled the anger of his own people. Unprecedented event. And I had a premonition that this is not going to end in Tunisia. That what they called, you familiar nicely, the Jasmine Revolution, I'm, uh, uh, that's a beautiful term, that's my middle daughter's name, I love it, uh, the, because Tunisians, when they go out in the evening, they, the men, not the women, put a jasmine flower over their ear. Um, but uh, so it was so um, blessed and hopeful and democratic and non-Islamist non and so on and so forth. But I had a premonition at the time that this would spread, that this is not going to be remain contained in, in, uh, in the confines of Tunisia, despite the fact Tunisia is different. It is more or less the most middle class of all Arab countries. Most of them fall into either the category of unbelievably rich. I've just been to Dubai, I can tell you, for the first time uh, the other week, and it's mind-boggling. Or the miserably, like miserably poor. But, and very few in between. But Tunisia is a sort of middle-class, southern European, Mediterranean country in its uh, uh, social structure. So it is different. But nevertheless, I had a feeling that this is not going to remain a Tunisian story. And um, I can't tell you, I wouldn't dare, that I already imagined that within weeks, President Mubarak of Egypt, who ruled without challenge for more than 30 years, would be in a cage on a stage being accused of treason. But I had a sense that this would spread. I actually uh, went off and uh, settled down, wrote a draft paper, tried to sell it to my boss at the time, National Security Advisor Uzi Arad. Uzi says, forget about it. I'm not going to let circulate anything that raises questions about the stability of Egypt. So I packed it up and gave it to my friends in the military intelligence department where I grew up uh, as a professional, and they made some good use of it. But soon enough, this spread like wildfire. As I said, it spread to Egypt by the 25th of... This all happens in Tunisia as a result of a really singular event. You know the chaos theory, the butterfly wings that cause a tsunami. This particular butterfly was a fruit seller by the name of Boazizi who set himself alight and died of his wounds because uh, of police iniquities. He was protesting their uh, behavior towards him, and that ignited a wave of national protest against the president who was basically a uh, brut brutal policeman, uh, grew up in the police, uh, Ben Ali, Zain al-Abidin Ben Ali, and, uh, and that, that was the beginning of it. But it soon spread in January 2011 to Egypt, where hundreds of thousands uh, came to Tahrir Square and elsewhere around the country to call on Mubarak to go, Erhal, leave us. And then, Tuni then Libya, Syria, Yemen. It almost blew up the regime in Bahrain and the Saudis intervened to save it. Across the region, Something was happening that brought down not only individual leaders, but regimes, and in fact, countries disintegrated in front of our eyes. It was a very dramatic set of events because uh, for years, we've been used to a reality in which basically People just stayed in power forever. It was a st an interesting uh, shift because 
in the late 40s and early 50s against the background of decolonization and the defeat in the war, uh, Israel's uh, victory over the Arab countries in the War of Independence and so on. You had a series of coup d'etats and, and revolutions and uh, dramatic changes. Uh, the average lifespan of a government in Syria was about 11 months uh, until the next one came and hanged his predecessors. And, uh, and then uh, at one point, the Syrians decided to commit national suicide and become part of Egypt in 1958. And then three years later, they figured they've made a big mistake and came out again of the Union. And there was a period, I would say, until the early 60s of turmoil in much of the Arab world. And then the regimes figured out how to stay in power. And for decades, we had such level of, I used to call it, catatonic stability, you know. Nothing changes for years and years and years. Muammar Gaddafi was once compared by an American Secretary of Defense to a um, fly speck on the pages of history. Well, he managed to soil 42 pages of annual history before he was swatted out. This fly, gadfly. Gaddafi came to power in 69. Um, on the other end of the spectrum of human decency, I'm saying this without reservation, uh, King Hussein of Jordan, who did fight us in, in 67, but ended up very quickly becoming a uh, covert and then an overt partner. Um, came to power in the, uh, as, a, as a teenager in the last years of the Truman administration and died in the last year of the Clinton administration. That gives you a sense of just uh, how stable Jordan remained against all odds. It still is stable, and I'll tell you why as we go along. But many of these, uh, uh, Syria, after all these coups and revolutions, and, uh, uh, and then you have the Assad, father and son, in power now for 53 years. Well, sort of power, because Syria is not exactly Syria anymore. But, that, but for many, many years, decades, it was held first by father until his death in 2000, and then by son and so on and so forth. Mubarak inherited the, uh, the presidency of Egypt when Sadat was assassinated in 81 and held it for 30 years. So we were used to basically, first of all, looking at very prolonged periods of governance, stability, enforced by very effective government repression, And I would say almost an identity in the minds of us analysts between the man and his government and its interests. Like we thought about Egypt, but we were really thinking about Mubarak. And we thought about Libya, but we were just thinking about the brother leader, Muammar uh, al-Qadhafi, who, who called his country the Jamahiriya. The, the, the governance of the masses, but he was the one mass that mattered. Um, and then, uh, and so we, we really, uh, we think still of Syria as Assad and Assad as, as Syria. But all of a sudden we were forced to reconsider the way we look at the region, at interests, at nations. And some of them, of them were falling apart in front of our eyes. To this day, Libya is an abstraction. There are two governments, one in Tripoli, one in Benghazi, Tripolitania and Cyrenaica by its ancient names, by their ancient names, are uh, in a, in a bay and, and a kind of uh, civil war in abeyance. 
the South is completely chaotic and ruled by various fac um, uh, nomad factions. Here we have Bedouins in, in, uh, in uh, the Sahara. We have the Tuareg and other coalitions of tribes. So Libya is not a country anymore. Syria. Um, when I was in the government in the National Security Council, I, I used, to, when, when people came to me to talk about Syria, I kept on my desk a, uh, a small uh, old edition uh, copy of uh, Julius Caesar, uh, De Bello Gallico. And I used to uh, start with about, that's about my entire Latin. Let, let me not mislead you. But, uh, Gallia in tres partes divisa est. Oh, Gallia is divided in three parts, and so is Syria. And that was the beginning of the discussion. There is no Syria. There are by now three, depends on how you count, but basically three parts of Syria. And this has been the case now for a fairly long period of time. There's the Assad Syria, and he is now in control of most of the populated areas of the country. There is rebel Syria in the north, and adjacent to it are areas which have actually been swallowed, chewed and swallowed uh, by Erdogan's Turkey, and in, in fact becoming an adjunct of the Turkish state. Uh, Afrin, uh, depopulated of its Kurdish uh, original population and, and repopulated uh, by the Turks. And then you have the Kurdish areas in the north east of the country, the, they call it by the name Rojava, the western part of Kurdistan, which extends further east to, into Iraq and so on. And, um, and uh, basically, where uh, not only Assad's writ does not run, it's actually governed by um, the Syrian Democratic Forces, which is a fancy name for the Kurds, actually. And they are in alliance with the US military. And so you have a country with uh, Iranian and Russian, Iranians and Russians in the Assad Syria, Turks in the rebel Syria, and Americans in the Kurdish Syria. So you cannot really speak about Syria anymore in the traditional sense. Iraq has been broken up now for much longer. It did not await the Arab Spring to disintegrate. It has a Kurdish state in the north, in, which is sovereign in all but name. You can fly to Erbil, you don't ask permission from Baghdad to actually go there. It's got, it has its own government, its own uh, economic system, its own language, its own life. In the south, there are Shia. Uh, the, the Sunnis and the Shia have been killing each other uh, from uh, about 20 years now. And, uh, well, Lebanon has been an abstraction also for many, many years. More uh, a state of mind than a state. A, an empty governmental shell invested by the agents of a foreign power. Because Hezbollah, at the end of the day, are Iranian proxies more than they are Lebanese. They've brought nothing but misery to the Lebanese. And even our own Palestinian cousins right here are now, since 2007, under two different governments, two different orientations, Hamas in Gaza and the Palestinian Authority in Ramallah. So you're looking at a landscape which is broken up and you can no longer analyze what's going on in, in the elegant terms of raison d'etat and, uh, and, and the interest of nations and the balance of power in its uh, uh, pure Kissingerian form. So how do you map the reality in which we live? And um, gradually, I wouldn't say overnight, I think I, in my mind it sort of... Uh, uh, became clearer 
as we went along. And by 2014, I actually wrote a paper internally, which later you can dig up a version, an open source version of it, which I published when I left government uh, to work at the time in the Begin Sadat Center, uh, which most of us left and turned it into the Jerusalem Institute for Strategy and Security. Uh, but uh, which I call the game of camps. Uh, this would be rec recognized, of course, uh, by all of you who are uh, aficionados of the Game of Thrones, only this one is not graced by formerly benevolent blondes and cuddly dragons. <laughs> this is just the bloody mess. Uh, and I'm calling it the Game of Camps and not a Game of Nations. There's a very good book uh, by Miles Copeland about Nasser's Egypt in the 50s and 60s. He was the CIA agent who tried very much to be Nasser's handler for the US government. I don't know if, if you know what uh, he is really famous for, Miles Copeland. He's famous for being the father of the drummer of police. But anyway, um, going back to, uh, he called it the game of nations. I called it the game of camps. Because the, the more we looked at it, the clearer it became that this is not a story about national interests as much as it is a story about ideological orientations. About what brings together Groups within one country, countries under the control of a certain ideological element, into a, an affinity with each other that cuts across traditional national borders and transforms the region in which we live. And um, at the time, uh, we counted four. As you will see, uh, the numbers have now gone down, I would say, to three and a quarter, that which I'll explain. But since I, I, I ended up writing this paper in the, uh, the uh, late part of 2014, at the time we were thinking four. And let me first of all say why four and not six. Not six, because the two ideological orientations that will, uh, you would have expected to be part of this landscape, were no long, one was no longer relevant and one is not yet relevant. The one that's no longer relevant, by and large, is that of the non-religious, revolutionary radicals, socialists and nationalists, in some cases like the late but not lamented Saddam Hussein, I could easily say national socialists with the full bag of associations that come with it. People who did not see themselves uh, as representing Islam as a religion, but rather Arabism as a uh, national movement, pan-Arabism, to be precise. At the same time, they picked up elements of socialist um, governance, government-centered economics, and so on. And they borrowed heavily on the uh, totalitarian experiences uh, they saw elsewhere in the 20th century. And for a while, these were the dominant forces of regional life. Gamal Abdel Nasser, who after 56, which he lost militarily and won, hands down, diplomatically, because the Americans and the Soviets intervened against us, the Brits, the French, to rob us of our achievements in the uh, uh, intervention against Egypt in 56. And then he becomes the hero of the Arab world, the mystical figure, the, uh, the impressive leader, with uh, great uh, ability to uh, mobilize the masses in Egypt and beyond the borders of Egypt 
as I said, the Syrians were willing to come under his rule. Uh, others in the region admired and uh, adored him. We smashed him up in 67, and then for, uh, for three years he was a dead man walking until he actually died at the ripe old age of 52 uh, of heartbreak and, uh, and diabetes. Uh, but <laughs> but um, um, he was, uh, for years, the mythical figure dominating the region <laughs> from a position of socialist, secular nationalism. Saddam Hussein in Iraq aspired to rise to the same position, utilizing the riches of Iraq and the military might of Iraq, which defeated the Iranians in an eight-year-long war to conquer the Gulf countries, first Kuwait, as you remember, in 90, and then uh, he probably aspired for more. We all know how that ended with the uh, American war in 91, which cut down his ambitions. The Assad clan was for years part of this pattern of uh, secularist, socialist, nationalists, but by now, of course, Assad is fighting for the sheer survival of family, clan, um, faction, if you wish, the confessional group of the Alawites in Syria, and no longer for the ideology of pan-Arabism, which is as dead as the dodo. So um, basically, what once upon a time was the dominant ideological grouping, orientation, that shook up the region that we in Israel fought against, the, uh, e that even the Palestinians uh, basically tried to emulate through talking about socialism and, and, and uh, secularism. Basically, these have been marginalized once Nasser was defeated, Saddam ended up on the gallows. The Soviet Union, who strategically was the mainstay of these forces in the region, died on them, four legs in the air, as we used to call it in my day in the, in the Directorate of Military Intelligence, the UFFR, the Union of Fewer and Fewer Republics, as it fell apart. Um, basically, this was out. At the other end, there may have been hopes, expectations, yearnings in the West and in some segments of society among our neighbors and even here in Israel. Um, I remember a conversation I had at the time with Nathan Sharansky, a great advocate of democratic liberations from totalitarianism. And there was a hope that the, the young, how shall I put it, Twitter boys and Facebook girls or the other way around, who, um, who organized and put together and, and, uh, and came out in the uh, tens of thousands into the streets of Cairo and elsewhere, that they would actually bring about a liberal political transformation of the region. But this was not to be. Frankly, they knew how to bring down governments. They had no idea and no preparation and no stomach for the hard work of actually holding government, creating a, an effective liberal model. There were no Madisons or Hamiltons to teach them how to translate a revolution which was inspired by the ideas of liberty. And I have to say, that to some extent, it was inspired also by the ideas that the Bush administration, for all its faults, did bring into the regional discussion after the conquest of Iraq, the, you know, the voting patterns, 
political parties, the, uh, the purple finger of the voters, um, all these symbols did inspire elements of this liberal camp that should have been, in the hopes of many, the, uh, the camp of the future. But they failed in the test of holding power and consolidating power. The only, the only country in which, for a while, they were part of the government, together with some conservative elements, was actually Tunisia. And even there, if you look at the situation now, under President Kaiser, um, they are being um, repressed. The country is becoming increasingly more repressive. I would say repressive, first of all, against the Islamists, but also against the liberals. So there's very little left of the hopes of liberalization of Arab politics generated in, uh, in the winter of uh, 2011. Egypt, which, you know, for many years had a parliamentary liberal tradition uh, from 1923, well, constitution of 1923 until the officers' coup in 1952, Egypt could have been a testing ground for more liberal politics. But, the, but it was first captured by the Muslim Brotherhood and then within a year by the military once again. And it is Sisi riding on the power of the military which rules now. And when you see an election result of 89 point something percent, you know that uh, democracy has not taken hold in, uh, in the fertile ground of the Nile Delta. So no socialist nationalists still at play and no liberals, so not six, four. And of these four, three are variations on a theme. And the theme is Islamist totalitarianism. And here I want to be very precise because it's easy to be swept. And I've seen this happen to very serious people in Israel and in the West into a denigration of Islam as such or into the um, very elegant explanation of modern of history offered by the late great professor from Harvard, Samuel Huntington, who actually wrote a book that was translated into Hebrew by Shalem. So I should say this is a great book, very important, fascinating, erudite, and dead wrong. Um, uh, but, ne but nevertheless, uh, a book you should be aware of and, and, and uh, should have read called The Clash of Civilizations. Basically, the image he conjures up is that with, with uh, the ideology of communism dead, we are not looking at the global victory of liberalism, as people like Frank Fukuyama and others uh, we're hoping for, uh, uh, Charlie Krauthammer called it the unipolar moment, Fukuyama called it the end of history, the argument is over, liberalism has won. No, but Hunting, what Huntington uh, envisioned was a clash by civilizations against civilization, Western civilization against uh, Chinese or Confucian civilization and against Islamic civilization and this would be the organizing principle. Very carefully, I would say, and I used to say this also to my younger officers when I was still in, uh, in, business, in government business, don't make grand generalizations on one case. Anyone willing to venture a guess? In 1993, 
when Huntington wrote first the essay and then the book, what was the singular test case he was looking at? Which is one that fits the image of civilizations clashing. Yes? Generally, yes, because the Soviet Union also broke into six Islamic republics of sorts. But that was actually a non, not a very violent business. But a, another communist country broke up at the time, and that did fall into warfare, an ugly warfare, and along, roughly along civilizational lines. No, actually, that was earlier. Um, Right, Bosnia. 93, this is the Bosnian situation. Bosnia breaks up into a Croatian part, Catholics, Western European kind of, Serbs, Eastern Orthodox, which in Huntington's book is a different civilization. And uh, the, Bos the actual Bosnian or Bosnaks, who are Muslim, very elegantly, Bosnia provides the template. But when you start looking deeper, you find, I'm looking strictly at Islam, that most of the people who died in the last 30 years are Muslims who died at the hands of Muslims. And this is not a clash of civilizations, but a clash within a civilization. And the clash, and I'm oversimplifying an extremely complex set of issues, but the clash, the nature of the clash has to do with the fact that in the 20th century, specifically in the uh, second quarter of the 20th century, 100 years ago, just short of 100 years ago, we saw the rise in the region of new interpretations of Islam. Versions, <coughs> or dare I say, perversions of Islam, which, if they were Kentucky racehorses, I would say, of Islam by modern European totalitarianism, hybrids. Um, a mix of ideas that do come from Islamic tradition. Remember, Islam is a conquering religion. It was led politically and religiously by the Prophet and his successors. It became very quickly an empire. It's, uh, I'm talking about Sunni Islam, basically, because the Shias suffered and continue to suffer uh, defeat. But uh, um, we, unlike Christianity, with for hundreds of years of persecution and our own history in Egypt and in, the, in, the, uh, in exile, uh, Islam was a conquering religion and it's easy to reconstruct it as a political movement. But the characteristics that these people, Hassan al-Banna in Egypt, Maulana Abul Ala Maududi in India, in British Muslim India, later Pakistan, and others, the characteristic, aside Qutub, again, later also in Egypt, the characteristics that they gave to their ideology were deeply colored not only by elements of Islamic tradition, but also by the experience of modern totalitarian politics. Let me illustrate this with one example, or one how do you, what, what is the title of the leader of the Muslim Brotherhood now in jail in Egypt? The term is Al Murshid Al Am. Murshid, to those of you who know Arabic, is a guide. Does that ring a bell? Try German. How do you call a tour guide in German? A rise of fear and a guide, a fear is a guide. Or a guide is a fear. What, it, there, there's, some, there's some powerful imagery here. Um, 
Have you ever stopped to think why is it that we always use left and right when we talk about politics? I mean, we are taught that this has to do with the seating arrangements of the Assemblée Nationale in 1792, right? The Jacobins, the radicals set on the left, the, uh, the Girondists, uh, the more moderate wing set on the right. So here we are with left and right, and we keep using this. But come on, I mean, most of us are not quite aware of the French Revolution anymore. Why do we keep using that language? And my explanation is that it basically speaks to a very elementary act of human choice. You come to a T in the road, and you can choose to go right or left. It's a, it symbolizes the act of political choice. However, when you have a murshid, a Führer, a guide, I'm not trying to denigrate any of the guides that took you around, but if you are following a guide, you are no longer asking yourself, shall I go right or left, right? You follow. That's the whole idea of having a guide, a murshid. This is, in a nutshell, where the operational models, the conceptual structures, of modern totalitarianism seep into the Islamist bedrock and turn the ideas of people like Hassan al-Banna, Maududi, and others into what I've called the hybrid of modern totalitarianism and religion. By, not, by 2014, when I was looking at the landscape, there were three variations or as uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu actually said at the UN, I wrote this line, uh, three branches of the same poisonous tree. The poisonous tree is the, the tree of Islamist totalitarianism, but we were looking at three different camps. We are still looking, more or less, at three different camps that rise from the same ideological imperative. One, at the time, very frightening. By now, less so. And there's a lesson there. Was Daesh, ISIS, and other uh, offshoots of what the US met on 9-11, namely Al-Qaeda. Salafi jihadists, that's to say people who uh, yearn to return to the foundational elements of religion. Salaf means the, the way of the ancients, essentially. Um, but through the act of jihad, of warfare, defining themselves, actually, strictly by the jihadi identity, The, uh, basically looking at their own societies and their own leaders as people who have committed um, the ultimate offense of leaving Islam as it should be, becoming apostates. This is why these, and, and, and many of these movements reacted to the state of their society by actually leaving physically the urban areas, finding place in the, in the desert in which they could prepare for a violent takeover. Any one of you who may have read uh, the novel by uh, Alaa al uh, uh, The Yaqobian Building, which is a good description of Egypt in the 90s, a harrowing description of Egypt in the 90s, would know how this went. They call these movements, uh, they call their, their, their attitude Takfir wa hijra. Takfir, that's to say we define our own society, our own leaders as kafirs, as apostates or, 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 or infidels. And we migrate, like Muhammad did when he left the city of Mecca to go to Medina, build his uh, forces and then reconquer it uh, and, and establish his state. Uh, hijra the uh, migration, internal mental migration, and sometimes physical migration to uh, terrorist cells 
in country or outside the country. And when the Egyptian regime hit them hard, many of them ended up in the 90s in refuge in places like Afghanistan. This is how Al-Qaeda, Al-Qaeda meaning the base, literally it means a base, came into being. So uh, these types of movements culminated in the rise in 2014 of the Islamic State. The, the camp defined by the idea that the, the national borders should be erased, that the caliphate should rise again. In fact, the claim of um, a man who called himself Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, he's no longer with us, uh, he went like, uh, like Bin Laden before him, he is now fish food in the Indian Ocean. The uh, Americans who killed him had the uh, right idea of not leaving a, a grave to be venerated. Uh, but um, at the time, uh, his, actually, his actual name was Ibrahim al-Samarai from a town in Iraq called Samarai. But he called himself Abu Bakr, the, first, the, first, the name of the first caliph, Khalifa, um, successor of Muhammad after the Prophet's death. And um, uh, Baghdadi, because in his mind he would reconquer Baghdad, turn Iraq, uh, it and Iraq into the heart of a new Islamic empire, like in the Abbasid uh, days of glory in the uh, 8th and 9th, 10th century. Um, and uh, it's essentially wiping out the national borders of countries. He, actually, he managed to conquer in the chaos and, and anarchy of much of Syria and Iraq, a huge territory extending over large parts of Syria and large parts of Iraq, including the city of Mosul. And he, the, the caliphate he was created, creating, which he called uh, Dawla al-Islamiyah, the Islamic State. At the time, it was referred to as Dawla al-Islamiyah fil Iraq was Sham, or Daesh by uh, its Arab initials. I, uh, everyone calls it ISIS. We are stuck with this term, although I've heard uh, a number of reasons why it shouldn't be ISIS. First of all, um, I've heard the Egyptian National Security Advisor, Lady a very formidable lady, Faiza Abu Naga, in a meeting I had of national security advisors, he said, how can you call these people ISIS? That's the name of the Egyptian goddess of love. Uh, but also because actually they have spread beyond Iraq and Syria. So the second IS is no longer, they're no longer confined to Iraq and Syria. There is a province in Sinai. They have obtained the uh, oath of uh, um, allegiance from the Boko Haram child, uh, women, abduc girl abductors in, in Nigeria, from elements in the Philippines and so on. So they are no longer just I Iraq and Syria. In Libya, they had a base until it was extirpated in 2016 and so on. And finally, um, when you say uh, Iraq was sham, Iraq is Iraq, but Sham is not just Syria. Sham is an Arab term that basically covers Syria, Lebanon, the land of Israel, Jordan, they would say Palestine, they, basically the whole region uh, that we call the Levant. So professional intelligence agencies actually use ISIL, Islamic State in Iraq and the Levant as a translation, literal translation of Daesh. So that was one camp, and in 2014, it looked very formidable and very frightening. The way they basically slaughtered and drove away the Iraqi army in large parts of, of Iraq, uh, making mincemeat meat of the assumptions that the American uh, withdrawal left behind, that the, the Iraq can... Uh, handle its own business. Well, it couldn't. Yes? Um, is the ISIL um, province in Sinai the reason that Egyptian border patrol 
control on the border with Israel face Egypt and not Israel? No, it's mostly around El Arish. Um, the Egyptians have managed to prevent them, except a few occasions, from actually coming to the border. If you promise not to tell anyone, I'll tell you that the New York Times, I wish they didn't, but they're not always wrong, was not wrong when they said that Israel is actually helping the Egyptians fight them, including airstrikes in Sinai, coordinate. And they are basically northern Sinai, but not right, normally, usually not right up to the border. They have suffered, they've inflicted very heavy losses on the Egyptians and the local population. But over the last two or three years, the Egyptians very slowly gained the upper hand. Uh, so they're not right now uh, very much uh, an Israeli concern, although we, we keep a BDI on what's happening in Sinai in close coordination with the Egyptians. The, the, this coordination explains quite a lot about what's happening between us and Egypt nowadays. Elsewhere, they've lost their hold in Libya. They are present in other places. And they definitely have a hold on the minds of deluded young people uh, in Muslim communities in the diaspora. But uh, at the time, they looked very formidable. Since then, they were first stopped in the rush forward by the brave, I should say, women and men of the Kurdish militias in Kobani, northern Syria. And then after that battle, step by step, uh, a, a uh, bizarre coalition that included the United States and the Iranians, for reasons I'll explain, and others, and came together and Daesh was reduced step by step until Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi was hunted down in his cap former capital in Raqqa in Syria and killed and his successors have been eliminated one by one. It is not dead yet. Uh, they, uh, there's, there's fire, there's em you know, the embers are still red, but it's basically not a state anymore, and it's hardly a camp anymore. And I would carefully say that uh, this has been reduced from a, a full camp to a, a remnant. Another camp was that of the Muslim Brotherhood, to which Hamas belongs 100%. Hamas is a Muslim Brotherhood offshoot. The Muslim Brotherhood itself was originally an Egyptian movement. It has spread around the region. It has spread into Muslim communities in the West. Um, it is very influential, for example, in, the, in organizations like CARE, in the United States. Um, it took power in parts of Libya, and it won power in a fair election. I'm not going to deny that. It was a fair election, and they won it in Egypt in, 19, in, uh, in 2012. They won a parliamentary majority, and they won the presidency by 52%, which is you know, a real thing, not a cooked up number. So Mohammed Morsi as president of Egypt was legitimately elected, but he represented a totalitarian Islamist movement. And we've seen previous cases, as you may recall, a certain Austrian in, 20, in 1933 who won an election but that, as, as they used to say, one man, one vote, one time. La, uh, the, 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 fir the first and maybe last election uh, that these totalitarian movements contested. And so the Egyptian military grew increasingly edgy as they saw Morsi beginning to do to them what uh, his ideological cousin Erdogan has been, did and has been doing in Turkey all these years, you will forgive my language, but Erdogan uh, as leader, close to the Muslim Brotherhood in ideology, uh, has been, what he has been doing to the Turkish military is essentially what you need to do to a male cat and you intend to keep it at home. 
Um, and uh, for years, the Turkish military was the most influential player in the country. They decided who will rule. If they didn't like the government, they overthrew it. They had a 50% position in the National Security Council of Turkey, which determined national policy. Basically, you could go nowhere without the permission and the say-so of the Turkish military. No longer. Erdogan has reduced them to a shadow of their old influence. And the Egyptian military was looking at, the, at Morsi doing step by step the same kind of thing over time. And they decided, um, like the famous Bedouin from the joke you know, about the uh, whistling cattle, you know the one? It was almost overrun by a train. And he came home and found, found out that his wife has bought a new whistling cattle. So he took an ax and smashed it. And he said, what did you do? He says, these you have to kill when they are still small. <laughs> so um, uh, the, the Egyptian military decided that they have to kill this before it grows out of control. And uh, they first organized, helped organize, together with some liberals, frankly, and some of the Gulf states, like the Saudis and the Emiratis, I'll explain, um, organized mass demonstrations against Morsi. On the 30th of June 2013, a year after he came to power, there were millions in the streets against him. They claimed there were 30 million. Let's cut this down by a factor of 10. It's still the largest demonstration against government anywhere in history, maybe. Certainly much larger than the Tahrir Square demonstrations against Mubarak. And three days later, on the 3rd of July, Sisi and the military ride into the presidential palace and explain to Morsi, as I said before, that his term of office is over and he will be spending the rest of his elected uh, uh, period in jail, awaiting trial. He died, actually, in jail, still awaiting trial. And then when the Brotherhood organized a mass protest, in the, uh, not in Tahrir Square, but in another square in Cairo, uh, Rabah al-Adawir, named after a Sufi woman mystic, who's actually buried here on Mount of Olives, uh, and then the nice mosque on her name, in the heart of Cairo. And then one night, the Egyptian military rolled in and basically massacred the demonstrators. Um, about a thousand, at least, were butchered. Recently, by the way, the photos from this surfaced as if this is something the Israelis were doing in Gaza. But it's fake. It's Egyptians 10 years earlier. Uh, so uh, <coughs> brutal as it is, that put an end to the capacity of the Muslim Brotherhood to challenge government in Egypt. So by now, there are only two places where the Muslim Brotherhood still hold sway. One is uh, partly in Western Libya, in Tripolitania, in the government uh, sitting in Tripoli the so-called government of national accord. The moment you see a name like this, you understand there is discord. And the government, and, and the other one is the Gaza Strip, or was the Gaza Strip, where Hamas held sway and now has been reduced to uh, largely the underground of Khan Yunus. But that, we'll have time to talk about this later. But these are the Muslim Brotherhood camp elements. What made them influential was that they were being supported not only by Erdogan, as I said before, whose ideology, the AKP, the Adalat Vekalkinme Party, the Justice and Development Party, which is a modernist Islamist movement close in its ideas to the Muslim Brotherhood, Let's call them Muslim cousins. Um, but they were also supported by the royal family of Qatar. The Qataris, for various reasons, decided that their um, 
preference, political preference, in the game of camps is for the Muslim Brotherhood camp. And this is why they've been pouring money into Hamas in Gaza. That is why they've tried to support Morsi in Egypt. This is why they are meddling in the politics of uh, uh, other players in the region. And uh, this is also why they were um, ostracized and, and besieged by the other members of the Gulf Club, uh, the, um, the GCC, the Gulf Cooperation Council. Uh, for a number of years. So it's Turkey and Qatar in support, and the Muslim Brotherhood, uh, basically the second camp in my list of camps. Daesh, ISIS types, Al-Qaeda offshoots, one, and then the Brotherhood and its supporters, number two. The third camp, and the one that at the end of the day, from an Israeli perspective, has become the most dangerous. And I'm saying this despite what happened on the 7th of October. I'm still saying the most dangerous. Not Hamas, but the camp led by Iran. Now, the Iranian proposition is a bit different, because they are actually Shia. I'm not, well, they don't want to go into the full history of what separates the Shia from the Sunnah. It's essentially a political division. Who should have ruled the world of Islam, the nation, the Ummah, after the death of the Prophet? Should it have been his son-in-law and father of his grandchildren, Ali, or the actual uh, uh, Khulafa, caliphs uh, who, who took over? And should the sons have become the caliphs or the clan of Muawiyah, the Umayyads, who actually defeated and killed them and became the rulers of, the, of, of, of Islam. So the Shia have always been bearing a sense of grievance. History went wrong. History could go wrong and did go wrong. In this, they are closer to us, Jewish tradition. There are also other funny aspects in which the Shia contrary to what you would imagine, uh, closer to us than the Sunnah. For example, what is the holiest day of the Shia the year? No, just a quick question. Are there more like the story of how this can be similar to the Jesus story? Sort of. They borrowed on the sacrifice and death, but this is death in battle, yeah. not by, uh, you, by, by crucifixion of a prophet, by the death, by the defeat in battle, the battle of Karbala. So they were, the symbolism is, uh, of sacrifice is there, the symbolism of history went, gone wrong is there. But uh, what is the holiest day of the Shia year? The it, exactly, it's the Ashura, it's the 10th day of the first month of the year, of the Muslim year, Rajab. Uh, of course, our, our months do no, no longer cohere because we add one and they don't. We need to keep our year in line with the seasons of the land of Israel because our religion has a land and theirs is universal. But the Shia religion keeps the tenth of the first month, uh, which the prophet practiced when he was in Medina among the Jews of Yathrib. And But they have given it a new meaning, historical meaning, the memory of the defeat in Karbala, which in their re reckoning happened on that day. So it becomes a political uh, day, a historical day. Um, the, any remnant of Yom Kippur has been uh, removed, but at the, originally this is the Ashura, this is what it was. So, um, but having said all this, for hundreds and hundreds of years, the Shia was essentially uh, accepting the fate the judgment of history, uh, it, okay, it did take control of one important country, Iran, which the, the dynasties in Iran uh, became Shia, Shia and turned the country into a Shia country. But basically, they were waiting for the end of history, the end of time, the arrival of their uh, 
the re-emergence of the imam, the 12th imam of the 5th imam, depends on which faction of the Shia you're talking about. The Houthis, by the way, are fivers, whereas the Iranians are twelvers. Doesn't prevent them from cooperating. And uh, it took one man coming back from exile in France, where he picked up the ideas of Franz Fanon and popular French Marxist Thiers Mondism, the Third Worldism, and reintegrated them into the Shia, namely Khomeini, Ayatollah Ruhollah Khomeini, coming back from exile in, from France in 79 to take control of Iran. And he brings with him the idea that the Shia is not just an aggrieved faction of Islam. The Shia in itself, in his mind, is a revolution. Iran becomes a revolutionary state. And there's a difference, a fundamental difference between raison d'etat, the logic of state, the interests of Iran, and raison de revolution, the, the logic of revolution, the purposes of revolution. Iran has a, as a state has no quarrel with Israel whatsoever. We have taken not a sheep or, nor a camel from them, as they say. In fact, there's a monument in Israel to Iranian-Israeli cooperation. It's 200 kilometers long and it leaks from time to time. It's called the Eilat Ashkelon Pipeline. It was built to carry Iranian crude to European ports when we were still friends under the Shah. We have common interests. We have no quarrel, territorial or otherwise. We have no economic conflict of interest. It's purely ideological. There is other, no other reason in the world for Iran to look at Israel as an enemy other than that, that for Khomeini and Khamenei now as his disciple and successor, being in the business of destroying Israel is the one great legitimizing purpose of the Iranian regime, internally and regionally. Yes? But isn't Iran a bulwark against any compelling regional challenge? Could you say that again? Iraq was. Iran is... Well, why can't Israel just be a threat because it's a powerful country in the region? That's my because if we were friends, why should they see us as a threat? We never threatened them. We have no regional hegemonic ambitions. Maybe the Saudis do. Maybe the Egyptians want it. Israel, by definition, has no fantasies about being hegemonic in the region. Iran does. And for them, the as I said, being in the business of destroying it, pursuing the destruction of Israel, becomes the ideological tool of legitimizing their bid for regional hegemony, and also the explanation of why they have sacrificed so much. The Iranian people know, I assume, because they do business across the border, that when Khomeini came to power in 79, Iran was three times richer than Turkey. Roughly the same population, so it computes the same as GDP and GDP per capita. Three times richer. Now they're, I think, about four times poorer. The country has fallen behind because of this, of this ideological fantasy of theirs. But what justifies this for the Iranian people internally and for their brothers in the rest of the Muslim world is the fact that they are holding up the vision of destroying Israel that the Sunni traitors in the various countries that signed peace treaties with Israel uh, the, the flag that they lay down on the floor. Uh, this is why you have a street in Tehran named after Eslambouli, the Egyptian officer who assassinated Sadat in 1981. Yes, questions? Uh, yeah, so you said uh, you could summarize, are you summarizing the R group or the T group? What do you mean by that? First of all, internally, 
ex explaining to people why we are in this death, life and death struggle, and that justifies all the sacrifices we've been making. Regionally, in the Arab and Muslim world, in terms of Iran being the one power upholding this ambition to have Israel destroyed, and ultimately also explaining why they are in pursuit of a nuclear weapon. Yes? Um, given that we just speak about Israel as the little station and America as the big station, is there like reason for, um, like the purpose that their regime has now, why would it be limited to just destroying Israel? No, it's not limited to destroying Israel, you're right. In the broader scheme of things, Israel is, in, as they see it, the embodiment of the post-1945 global dispensation, the way the world was organized after World War II. In the, in the minds of people, the likes of Khomeini, Khamenei, uh, Ahmadinejad, Raisi, the wrong guys won that war. Or let's say the wrong guys lost it. The, he tried, by the way, to uh, Ahmadinejad tried to say so in Germany and couldn't understand why the Germans were not pleased. Um, the Israel is part of this world that was created by the hegemonic forces, and, and in the eyes of the Iranians, the Russia, the, the Soviet Union, and the United States are all uh, in the same category of the hegemonic forces that deny the world of Islam its proper place in the world. But the existence of Israel is the symbol of all that's wrong in the world today. So this is why the Iranian camp, at the end of the day, is such a threat. And the Iranian government is pursuing a military nuclear option, and it's getting closer by the day. And it has a strategy of maintaining a whole set of proxies, a camp of proxies, which includes, first and foremost, Hezbollah in Lebanon. Within the Palestinian system, they, are, they have a proxy, Palestinian Islamic Jihad, which is fully owned. I mean, the difference between Hamas and Pidge, Palestinian Islamic Jihad, vis-a-vis um, -vis Iran, is literally a different proposition. Hamas work with the Iranians, Pidge works for the Iranians. How, why Hamas work with the Iranians is a good question, because um, in Syria, for example, they supported the rebels while the Iranians supported the regime. So they, they uh, were splayed badly. Uh, in the early years of the previous decade. But now that the war in Syria has more or less come to a standstill with the partition that I described earlier, this is no longer an issue. So Hamas and Iran can cooperate closely on Iran's central purpose, which is being in the business, as I said, of destroying Israel. Yes? Well, it, the Iranians. You know, yeah, the no, that no it, it is strictly changes overnight from a strategic friendship right. to outright um, eliminationist or hostility when Khamenei comes to power after the overthrow of the Shah in 1979. That's the point of cleavage, 1979. Yes. Because they say that this is the day in which the sons of uh, Ali, Hassan and Hussein, uh, who should have been the caliphs, I mean, one of the father, the elder son should have been the caliph, were killed in battle by uh, the Umayyads who took over uh, in, uh, uh, near the town of Karbala. This is all 7th century uh, AD. And, uh, and therefore, it becomes a historical moment of mourning, not just a religious 
uh, a day. Okay? Yeah, in the sense that this is poli about politics, in, about who should have been in power and who is now in power. Uh, in historical, yeah, historical and po political in the sense that this is about power. The, the difference in Shia and Sunnah originally was about power. Who should have been in power? Yes. Um, may I please clarify whether the difference, like the relationship between Houthis and Iran, is it like Hezbollah or Hamas? Well, the Houthis as I said, are not exactly the same kind of Shia as the Iranians. But this did not, prevent the, did not prevent the Iranians from basically turning them into a pro fully owned Iranian proxy, armed, trained, and prepared for battle by the Iranians in order to point a dagger at the Saudis from the south and hold, as they try to do now, in stranglehold, the Red Sea, and basically create on the Arabian Peninsula an Arabic-speaking Iranian um, presence. And they've used it also to, to fire rockets deep into Saudi Arabia, missiles deep into Saudi Arabia, uh, all the way to the Arab, United Arab Emirates and so on. So they're basically using them now as a very aggressive and effective Proxy. So the, the Iranian camp includes Hezbollah, the Houthis in Yemen, uh, important militias in Iraq, militias and actual Iranian forces on Syrian soil. In fact, the Assad regime is now, let's say, a condominium, is, is uh, uh, owned, quote unquote, has survived through the help of two players, the Iranians and the Russians. Now, they have different purposes, but they work together to save Assad's neck. So all of this has created for the Iranians a whole system of levers of influence that they are using to put pressure on Israel, to deter Israel from acting against their nuclear infrastructure. And this is the ultimate uh, of the three camps the Iranians remain the most dangerous, despite the fact that we were hit so painfully and so hard by Hamas. Uh, and Hamas is fully supported by the Iranians with one caveat. The Iranians do not intend to sacrifice their most important assets, namely Hezbollah, on behalf of, the, of Hamas. And this is why their level of involvement so far in the war has been just enough to show that they are doing something, but very far from their full capacity, which raises certain dilemmas. So finally, let me get to the fourth camp, very quickly. I just would mention we have about we go a minute or two over since we started a minute too late. <clears throat> we have about 10 minutes. Yes. And we have time for it tonight for further questions. Yeah, and then I'm, I'm, this is a give and take. You can cut me off in. Uh, at, at any moment. Yes. Um, but it, uh, otherwise, we can leave uh, our questions okay. hanging until yes. this evening. OK. <laughs> the fourth. And here, here, here's uh, um, the obvious. The fourth camp is the camp resisting all of this, which, for the sake of uh, simplification, I would call the camp of stability. The, force, the, the uh, countries, forces in the region who do not want to see themselves overthrown and destroyed by Islamism of any kind, Iranian, Brotherhood, or Daesh type of, uh, of Islamism. So very quickly you, you realize that this camp actually includes Israel as a member of good standing. And that has been the case already way before the Abraham Accords translated this reality into an overt diplomatic and economic and strategic cooperation. Because for the Moroccans, it was clear long ago. And for the Emirates and for the Saudis. With the Saudis, it's still going on in that part that I used to call the, the, the most uh, 
um, overpopulated part of the Middle East, under the table, where we all um, do business. But uh, it's still under the table, but, uh, but with the Emiratis, with the Bahrainis, Egypt, Jordan, whatever they say and do in the Jordanian parliament is one thing. What the Jordanian government and the Jordanian military do and the Jordanian intelligence services do is another. So we are basically in the same camp, the camp of stability. And, uh, and the uh, Abraham Accords <clears throat> in 2020 made this more evident, more real, but it was there already a few years before against the background of what I've just been describing. I'll say something very delicate and, and problematic because uh, I don't want to oversimplify things, but at the end of the day, when you look at sheer strategic imperatives of survival, that's also true for the Palestinian Authority in Ramallah. They cheered the fall of Morsi, so did we. They, the rise of Sisi and the, the, the new government in Egypt. They feared the Muslim Brotherhood. They hate Hamas as much as we do. Their intelligence services, their security services. You remember from Fauda, all the games between uh, Amn al the, the security services, and Hamas, and, and, and Shin Bet, and who plays with whom? Uh, why do they cooperate with us? Well, um, for gravitational reasons. It's not very pleasant to be thrown off the 16th floor, which is what Hamas did to their counterparts in Gaza. So if the IDF, if you need the IDF around to make sure that this doesn't happen to you, so be it. So it's, uh, but, but at the same time, this is also my opportunity to say, in conclusion, that we need to be careful not to oversimplify. Not everything in the region is reducible to this game of four camps. Right now, one of the worst things happening uh, on Earth, uh, in, in, in terms of mass slaughter, probably much worse than the fighting in Gaza, is the civil war that erupted in Sudan, including the genocidal, raids of the RSF against the Darfurians. And, and this is all strictly a power game with the Egyptians on one side and the Emiratis on the other side. So it's basically a, a, a quarrel between two power centers, both of which uh, are associated with elements within the camp of stability, but doing a lot to destabilize their own country in a bid for power. So not everything is reducible to, to, these, uh, to this analysis. The Iranians uh, are Islamists of a certain kind, but they fought Daesh to the death because uh, the Daesh uh, ideologically hates Shia almost as much as it hates America. So they fought, they actually helped the Americans destroy Daesh uh, in Iraq. Uh, the, the Iranian associated militias were part of the anti Daesh, anti ISIL coalition in Iraq. Uh, Assad may be an Iranian proxy on his one side of him uh, that uh, the Iranians helped survive, but he's a, not only is a, he's a strict secularist. Um, as you can see by the attire of his wife when she, she appears in public. But um, he is also not a Muslim. The Alawites are not, mu and not more Muslim than the Druze, a sect that has left the realm of Islam hundreds and hundreds of years ago. So um, uh, not everything can be uh, elegantly fit it can elegantly fit into this template. But as, a organ, as an organizing principle, as a scheme that ex helps explain much that has happened since 2011, and helps explain why Hamas 
is doing, has done what it did on the 7th of October and still hopes to survive and become a, a, a beacon of influence within the Islamist totalitarian challenge to the existing order. Uh, I think this, this analysis uh, of the game of camps uh, has proved, uh, proved itself to be useful for people uh, making decisions. And, and, and uh, over time, help define uh, our, own our own choices, our own policies, specifically the Abraham Accords and what went with them, the manner in which we deal with all the full complexity of the issue with the Palestinian Authority and their security forces. Look at the Aqaba process that was still there uh, before October 7. And the way we, are, we feel now that we are fighting a battle for our own future, for our own home, for our own survival, but also for the long-term interests of the camp of stability at large. Um, back in 2014, when I was still in government, we had Operation Protective Edge, Tsukaitan, to those of you who know it by its Hebrew name. And uh, we made a decision, by the way, to call uh, all our operations in their English name after cast lead, which sounded terrible, as if we are pouring cast, uh, molten lead on people. It was because it was in Hanukkah and it had to do with, uh, with, uh, with the dreidels. But uh, uh, then we decided to call of all of them something about protection. So it was... Uh, um, protective edge. Before that, it was a pillar of defense. And then in 2021, it was guardian of the walls. You, you, you see the pattern. Um, so um, in protective edge, uh, we fought, I believe, for seven rather than four, two weeks because we refused to take mediation from Turkey and Qatar. Why? Because they were the Muslim Brotherhood camp. And we wanted the Egyptians to handle the end game. And the American administration, the Obama administration, pushed us uh, via Kerry to work with the Turks and the Qataris, and we said no. And we carried on with the war until Hamas crawled on all fours at the time to Egypt to end the fighting. Today it's a fight to the finish, so it's no longer relevant. Uh, but even now, it's important for us to manage issues such as the hostages with the Egyptians rather than the Qataris in the key position because they don't belong in the same camp. We belong with the Egyptians in the same camp. And the Qataris, whom we've had to kiss up because of the hostages, belong to another camp. Yes, one... Right, that's the issue, Al Oudaid. Why is it that even American Republican senators, I mean, maybe we would do that in here, why is it that they even. The answer is that the Qataris are fantastic seducers. They've seduced the world. You have to ask yourself, you know, who lined his pockets, but they seduced the world into hosting the World Cup, the most important sports events other than the Olympics. Uh, amazing stuff. M billions of people watching. And the Gutteries uh, killed a few hundred or thousand Nepali and Indian workers, built these beautiful stadia, and hosted the best ever. And of course, it ended up with the French taking it with two players from San... Uh, with the Argentinians taking it, sorry, with, uh, in a game in which the two great stars play in a side in France owned by the Qataris. Strange stuff. They, they are, um, they've seduced people here. I'm not going to give names, but I know some. They've seduced people in America. They've bought American academics. 
They have brought American institutions. And they have offered the United States a base for which they pay out of their immense pockets. Um, full maintenance, everything in al is on them. So the United States feels quite happy with them in, historically. It was Trump's son-in-law, Jared Kushner, who negotiated a truce between the Gutteris and their five, five angry neighbors in the Gulf. So yes, there is. Uh, yes, Houston, we have a problem Thank with you. the Gutteris.